kind of out, but he's, he's getting mic'd up. And so, how long's your interview? Give me a minute, not even. I can give it up. Oh, yes. Good morning. Welcome to First Christian Church of Atlanta. It's good to see all of you here um, that are in, with us here as well as those at home. Um, one thing that I would like to mention and remind you about is that it has become a tradition at this church during the Advent season to wear your Christmas tie. So if you forgot, forgot to, to do that, that this morning, morning you've got, got next week to make amends. Make and now I'll call your attention to the screen, and I'm going to try and read what's on those slides back there, but at least you'll have a first-hand view of it. Uh, this is for networks, just a reminder that, uh, as always, uh, we need food contributions for networks. Oh. Next. Uh, I know that these are two events that the church is going to be holding. I'll let you just read from the slides as I can't see it very well myself. Next slide. Christmas Eve, we will have the candlelight service. It'll be at 1130. And I know that that could be a problem for some folks who don't like to be out late driving at that hour but I think that we can accommodate those that would need a, a ride. Also on Christmas Day, the worship service will be as usual at 11 o'clock. Next slide. You can't see it from here, can you? I can't see it, now. <laughs> so I'm going to let you read. All right, next slide. That's it. Go ahead. I would like to, for those of you who have been down here in the evenings and seen the brand new lights, 
it's like standing in a ball field. It's really kind of, after what we've become accustomed to, it's, it's a, a little startling. startling. So the concern was what the neighbors may think. So we've been up here a couple of nights in a row driving around the neighborhood, and uh, we, we think we're, we're not bad, but we did hear from one of the neighbors over on this side that he thought we were interfering with the animals sleeping and so forth, and uh, asked us to come by and take a look. He did it in a man very mature fashion. It wasn't a complaint. It was just, uh, let's see if we can deal with this. And our property chair, Sean Stone, met with him last night, I think, and uh, as did I. And uh, we, will, we will pursue what it takes to have our neighbors continue to be friendly, and uh, we will deal with them in a neighborly fashion as well. So we'll probably wait a few days to see if any of the other neighbors have comments, and then we'll be making those arrangements. So. Right now, stand as you can, and we will have our opening hymn, O Come, O Come, Emmanuel. Please be seated. And now we will have lighting of the Advent candle. The world of peace, the word of peace. We listen for stories where people stop hurting each other and start helping. We listen for words of peace from leaders. And we remember that Christ is the Prince of Peace. We light the second candle for the peace we listen for, that, si that sings in our hearts, and God's reign is near. Come quickly, shalom. Teach us how to prepare for a gift that compels us with justice to care. Our spirits are restless till sin and war cease. One candle is lit for the reign of God's peace.
This morning we have a guest minister, uh, Reverend Aaron Smith. I'd like to give you a little background on Reverend Smith. He is from the Pension Fund Area Director, holds a BA from Indiana University, Bloomington, and is a graduate of the University of Chicago Divinity School and Disciples Divinity House. He was ordained in the Christian Church, Disciples of Christ, in November 2015, while serving as Director of Evangelism at Light of the World Christian Church. We recently completed, he recently completed, a certificate in public management from the Indiana University School of Public and Environmental Affairs. He served with Christian Fund for 10 years and currently serves the Christian Church in Georgia, along with eight other disciples of Christ's regions. As an area director, he enjoys educating current and prospective members about retirement and savings benefits that will sustain them and their families. He now resides in Atlanta, Georgia, where he and his wonderful wife, Kia, were married at First Christian Church to Cater and their son, Asher. He and his wife, Kia, now belong to Ray of Hope Christian Church. Please uh, join me in welcoming Brethren Smith. Good morning, church. Uh, won't you pray with me? God of timeless grace, fill us with your joyful expectation. Make us ready for the message that prepares the way, that with uprightness of heart and holy joy we may eagerly await the kingdom of your Son, Jesus Christ, who reigns with you and the Holy Spirit now and forever. God of hope, you raised up John the baptizer as a herald who calls us to conversion. As we joyfully await the glorious coming of Christ, we pray for you, for the needs of the church and the world. Hear our humble prayer that we may serve you in holiness and faith and give voice to your presence among us until the day of the coming of your Son, Jesus Christ, who lives and reigns forever and ever. And hear us now as we pray from the silence of our hearts. Be with and abide with us, O God, and hear us as we pray the prayer that Jesus teaches us. Saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, Hallowed be thy name, your kingdom come, your will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever. Amen. There's a difference between planning and preparation. We can't plan the future that God holds, but we can prepare for each day by practices of generosity. Generosity helps us to forgive and to heal. It helps us to make peace in the world. It helps to bring justice and mercy to those in need. Our gifts this morning are one way we prepare for God's coming into the world in the most unexpected way. Will the deacons please come forward to collect our offerings and gifts?
For the blessings of this and all our days, we thank you, gracious God. Accept, we pray, not just this money, but also our lives, freely offered in gratitude for all you have done for us. Use them both in this place and wherever you might take us. Amen. The Gospel reading for today talks about watchfulness, that we need to be ready for Jesus' return, whenever that may be. We can't know when. We could read that as being watchful like a soldier guarding when he knows the enemy will attack. But that puts it in the frame of fear. We shouldn't be afraid of the Lord's return. But the image of, of those waiting for the bridegroom to come is more appealing and also found elsewhere in Scripture. It still reminds us to be ready and waiting, but it's not in fear. It's in expectation and joy. Part of the way we can be ready is to remember his words. As we gather at the table, we remember his words, his teaching, and his way, and commit ourselves to being a part of it. Amen. And the words are, For I have received of the Lord what I have also handed on to you, that the Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, took up the bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body that is for you. Do this in remembrance of me, in the same way he took the cup after the supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you drink this bread and drink of the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Amen. Let us pray. Jesus, the Apostle Paul, described the church as the body of Christ. All the members are joined together for the mutual good of the body. You, Jesus, provide the guidance and purpose. May we see the eating of this bread as our acknowledgement that your life, death, and resurrection have made it possible for us to be spoken of as one body, sustained by one divine life. Dear Heavenly Father, we ask in the name of your Son, Jesus Christ, to bless and sanctify this wine to the souls of all those who receive it.
Scripture this morning is from the book of Matthew, chapter 3, verses 1 through 12. In those days, John the Baptist appeared in the wilderness of Judea, proclaiming, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven has come near. This is one of whom the prophet Isaiah spoke when he said, The voice of one crying out in the wilderness, Prepare the way of the Lord, make his path straight. Now John wore clothes of camel hair, hair with a leather belt around his waist, and his food was locusts and wild honey. Then Jerusalem and all Judea and all the region around the Jordan were going out to him, and they were baptized by him in the Jordan River, confessing their sins. But when he saw many of the Pharisees and Sadducees coming for his baptism, he said to them, You brood of vipers! Who warned you to flee from the coming wrath? Therefore bear fruit worthy of repentance, and do not presume to say in yourselves, We have Abraham as our ancestor. For I tell you, God is able from these stones to raise up children to Abraham. Even now the axe is lying at the root of the trees. Therefore every tree that does not bear good fruit will be cut down and thrown into the fire. I baptize you with water for repentance. But the one who is coming after me is more powerful than I, and I am not worthy to carry his sandals. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. Here ends the reading of the morning scripture. Amen. And see it in their eyes. Empty people filled with care, headed who knows where. On they go through private pain, living fear to Laughter hides their silent cries. Only Jesus hears. People need the Lord. People need the Lord. At the end of broken dreams is the open door. People need the Lord. People need the Lord. When we Only we can 
can share. Amen, and praise God for that wonderful ministry and testimony. Amen. What a wonderful way to usher the Spirit of God, and good morning again, First Christian Church Atlanta. It's such a blessing to be here again with you. I've been in worship with you before, but not in this way, and it's such a, a privilege and honor to join you once again. So, and also thank you for the readers and the elders, of course, and uh, those who have read the scripture already for today, which is Matthew chapter chapter 3, verse 1 through 12, which is the story of John the Baptist introducing Jesus to the world, or rather, the world to Jesus. Our message for today is keeping up with the Christ in us. Keeping up with the Christ in us. Again, John the Baptist is preparing the way. He introduces Christ Jesus, that the kingdom of heaven is near. And the purpose of this announcement is to help us to keep up with Christ. And so that immediately brings us the question, what does it mean to keep up with something? I have to confess that I am from Indiana, where basketball is a huge undertaking. But when I moved here to Atlanta, to Georgia, I should say, I had to learn that uh, there was another sport that I needed to learn to pick up very immediately. And I understand that this was a big weekend for football here, wasn't it? Across the board, it was, uh, and before we go too far down that path, it's something to keep up. It, it, it means something to keep up with people, to keep up with, um, as I said, sports or whatever um, interest that come on our hearts, but there's nothing quite like keeping up with Christ. And that's what our text, I believe, introduces to us today. In our text, John the Baptist prepares the way for Jesus like no one else had ever done in the history of the world. The scriptures foretell that the coming of Jesus is... It, foretell his coming in many ways. For example, in Isaiah chapter 9, verse 6, when it says, for, un for to us a child is born, to us a son is given, and the government will be on his shoulders, and he will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, and Prince of Peace. And so John the Baptist's assignment is 
literally glorious. He gets to introduce the Christ to the world. The kingdom of heaven is here, he said, is near, he says. This seems like it should be a, cel a great celebration. The kingdom of heaven is here. Let us all celebrate, right? That's not how this story went. Even in our text, immediately, John the Baptist calls out a very specific group of people. We may know them well as the Pharisees and the Sadducees, the experts and the teachers of the law in his time. While he's proclaiming the good news and baptizing and the fire, the spirit of God is with him. I just love John the Baptist. He wore camel's hair and he uh, drank, ate locusts and, and honey were his diet. He was definitely on fire for, with the zeal of God. But he had an issue with the Pharisees. What was that issue? Could it be that the Pharisees were operating by the rules that God did not command him, them to operate by? Had they become experts in things that God never asked them to become experts in? Could it be that their beliefs and practices, and some might say even their theology, was out of date? Could they have become more interested in their own plots and agendas that they weren't focusing on the word of God and Jesus Christ himself? This is exactly what happened. This is what the text is telling us. The Pharisees and the Sadducees were later rebuked by Jesus for holding more closely to what he said were the rules of men than to the word of God. This passage in Matthew chapter 3 is leading up to the Sermon on the Mount, the famous passage that, that just happened a couple chapters after this in, in chapter 5. This is when Jesus reminds the people who are truly the blessed ones. He's helping everyone to get caught up. Look, 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 I want to remind you who are really blessed. It's the least of, the, of these. It's those who take care of one another, who put others before themselves. And he keeps reminding them through a series of new teachings. These new teachings address old scriptures such as the Ten Commandments. They address the concepts that people followed closely as a part of the law. And throughout the Sermon of the Mount, Jesus keeps repeating, you have heard. In other words, you have heard up until now. He, what he means by that is you have heard this from God through Scripture before. And now he's telling them that, yes, this is the law from God, and now I'm giving you a new teaching. By doing so, Jesus is demonstrating for everyone who's paying attention that he is God in the flesh. He is Emmanuel, as we celebrate in this season, because only God has the authority to make any updates to his own word, and only God can update the word without changing it. And through this sermon, the Sermon on the Mount, which is related to our passage today, Jesus is demonstrating that he is the Messiah. Jesus teaches, for example, that you have heard it was said, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. But I tell you now to turn the other cheek. And if anyone wants to sue you and take and take you to court, will give them to take your shirt, hand over your coat as well. If they tell you to go a mile with them, then go two miles with them. This is a new teaching. Jesus is updating the word of God in real time, which is just, it's just fascinating and it's just in itself. It's a mystery that I can only stand and be in awe of personally to imagine Jesus real-time updating what the scriptures say. 
But again, if we look closely, he's not changing anything. He's just filling in more of the truth, more of what they already know. He's letting those who are listening know that they should not just aim for the minimum, just do what is only the bare minimum of what they can do. God deserves more than that. People need more than that. They should look at both the spirit of the law and the letter of the law. To understand what Jesus was teaching that started with this introduction from John the Baptist, we need to make an effort to keep up with God, and in doing so, we will be blessed. Jesus is completely willing to help us to keep up with him. He's completely willing. The story of the gospel of Jesus Christ is not a story that's inaccessible. Sometimes it seems mysterious, and what are these concepts? What is the Bible talking about? But it's not meant to be exclusive. It's meant to be at inclusive at every turn. God is calling us closer and closer to keep up with him. Know God's intention and heart, which we find clearly in Scripture, scripture is that we be brought into a relationship and community with him present, fully present in that community. In fact, God mentions this again in 2 Peter verse 3 and 9, which says, God is patient because he wants everyone to turn from sin and no one to perish. He is giving more time for sinners to repent, the word says. All he asks of believers followers of Jesus, is that we keep up, or another way to say it is that we surrender to him. If you think about keeping up with Christ and surrendering to him, it's really the same thing. We can't keep up with him or remember what he teaches or accept what he says if we don't continually surrender to his will. And so I, this resonates with me personally because growing up, as a kid, I was the youngest child. I was uh, actually six years younger than the next child to me. <laughs> and so if you can imagine what that was like, I never really felt like I was caught up with anything. Um, and soon as my, my oldest stepbrother went into the military uh, soon after my, uh, my parents got married. So for most of my child, childhood, it was, there were five of us in the house. And six, again, six years between my brother and I, and just always felt like every day, you know, jokes are just flying over my head, you know, no idea what's, what's going on, couldn't uh, outsmart or outthink anybody in my family. And, you know, that really just sets in after a while. What's, what's happening in this house? And you just kind of find your own way to adapt to that. Couldn't. Uh, uh, ever beat my brother in basketball, never did, couldn't, you know, I uh, never won an argument with my sister, never happened one time and that I can remember growing up. And uh, that, that just, had, you ever had the feeling you just can't keep up, you're just not sh quite sure what's ha happening in the room? Have you ever been in a room like that? Well, this is what I think about when I think about, re when I look at the scriptures, you know, it can seem a little overwhelming, can't it? Where do I begin? What, what is really being said here in these 66 chapters? Where, what, where do I even start? How do I keep up with Christ? Have you ever thought about that? God says that my thoughts are not your thoughts. My thoughts are as high above the earth as the, uh, as the, as the ground is from the heavens. How would we ever really understand what God says or does unless he came down and made himself near to us? Unless he humbled himself as a servant, unless he made himself nothing and did everything in his power to give up his power to be in right relationship with us. It would never have happened 
otherwise. We never would have caught up to God. We never would have all of a sudden a light would have come on and now we get it unless he did exactly what he showed us in his word. And so that wasn't the end of the plan. In order for us to keep up with Christ, he kept on with the plan to not only this, but give us his very own spirit to dwell within us. A powerful spirit, the same spirit of God that we find spoken of all throughout, all throughout scripture, all throughout history. In fact, let me just take a moment to talk about one of my favorite examples of what it means to keep up was when, when God told the Israelites, I want you to carry my spirit in the ark, what's called the Ark of the Covenant, which contained other things such as Aaron's staff and the manna that, that was given as a sign of God's promise. The Ark of the Covenant was, uh, the, the Israelites were commanded to take that ark they were never to touch the ark, but they were commanded to carry it with them wherever they want, went for years. And there were so many um, rules and regulations around that, but it was for the people's own protection because they couldn't touch the ark lest they die. Imagine what that process was like to have to keep up with that spirit. I shouldn't say have to to keep up with those regulations. Well, what, the reason I'm saying this today is because we have that same spirit within us. And it's only by having that spirit with, within us, by giving our lives to Christ and his, with his promise of giving us the Holy Spirit that we can speak directly to God and to keep up with all that he tells us on a daily basis. And so the, the, this is the resolution. God not just, doesn't just um, bring, a, he's not bringing a problem, he's bringing us a resolution in how to be in a wonderful, glorious relationship with him. But back to the issue, back to the issue in this passage, the Pharisees and the Sadducees we're not in the right place. They, they even, um, there's even a, a parable that describes this a little further down. In one scripture, Jesus says, the ax is already at the root of the trees. Every tree that does not produce fruit, good fruit, will be cut down and thrown into the fire. In other words, God is pruning He is preparing the way for us to have a real relationship with him. John the Baptist, pardon me, says, I baptize you with for repentance, but after me comes the one more powerful than I, whose sandals I'm not worthy to carry. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and with fire. Imagine that. And the good news is that God is willing to help us because he understands the situation that we're in. He wouldn't ever withhold help from us if we are willing to accept it. And our scripture for today reminds us that, is possible, that it is possible to be in a place where we're not meant to be. If we look at our text again, John the Baptist is fully aware of who's on the scene. He's proclaiming the coming of the king who is Jesus, but the religious elite, those who know the law very well, are, are not, not keeping with repentance. So the major clue to us as readers is that this language that John offers lets us know that there is something to keep up with. Keeping with repentance. We know that we can't earn salvation from from it, and yet this scripture lets us know that we are called to be involved. But instead of performing, rather this passage lets, it, lets us know that we are called to avail ourselves. The Pharisees did not keep up. They were too concerned with their own ways, with their own rules that they put God's teaching 
teaching aside. In other words, what they were teaching was not even really in the Bible, or they were using it in a way that God did not intend for them to use. They were not really waiting for the Lord. How do we know that? Because if they were waiting for the Lord, they would have recognized him when he came. They would have said, there you are. Jesus, we've been waiting for you so, for so long, for years, for hundreds of years. And now we recognize your humility. We recognize your spirit and we know that you are here. But for some reason, that was not what happened. That's not how it took place. So he gave them another chance because that's the gracious God who he is. He gave them another opportunity to keep up, to get caught up with what he was doing. Again, in the, uh, in the Sermon of the Mount, the Beatitudes, he definitely made it clear, I am for for the least. I am for those who are taking care of one another. Someone asked him, what, which one is the most important? He said, love God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength, and love others as yourself. This is how we keep up with what God is doing and have his voice soundly and fruitfully in our lives on a daily basis. So he is here, and he is to come. When God says that he will never leave us nor forsake us, one of the ways that he fills, fulfills that promise is by leaving his spirit with us. This is consistent with the story of salvation for each and every believer in Christ. The Bible tells us that when a believer surrenders to Christ, they receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. We find this in Acts chapter 2, verse 38, where Peter declares, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. That is a powerful, powerful declaration that we sometimes don't look closely at, but it, when we look at the whole story, that's as powerful as it gets. The promise that we may keep the Spirit of God in what my, what my grandmother used to say often, indwelling in us permanently and forevermore. It does not get any better than that. And so let me pause and just say, there are many ways to keep up. I appreciate so much even the Advent candle as a symbol that um, resonates very deeply with me and my family is a tradition I'm familiar with going back to being a little boy because it reminds us just a way to keep up. It's a way, it's a symbol to say, this is where we are. And it being almost halfway, you know, lit here, it just shows us another way that we can keep up with the Spirit of God. In waiting, in waiting, we are blessed. So in, as far in terms of the indwelling of the Holy Spirit, this is a promise for all believers without exception, without favoritism. Everyone who gives their life to Christ receives this promise. And so keeping up with Christ is not meant to be difficult or burdensome. Jesus says that my yoke is easy and my burden is light. He's not intending to leave one single person behind. It's intended to be not an obligation, but a blessing to keep up with the Christ in us. But Christ gives us a new teaching how to keep up with him. It's not about memorizing scripture only uh, that, that we put into practice. It's not about public displays of religion that don't help anyone. It's not about praying in public and, as the word says, going on and on and on with long words so that we may be seen as good. It's about finding that person, as the Good, good Samaritan tells us, who is hurting within, among us? Who is in need in our, our community? 
even if we're on the way to a religious meeting, to stop and bandage that one that needs the most care, even on the Sabbath. Jesus brought us the most practical ways to keep up with him. He didn't say we needed to go to a particular school. He didn't say we needed to join a certain fraternity or sorority. He didn't even say we needed to go um, to be in a certain neighborhood or live in a certain place or to have a certain amount of money in the bank. But he did say, if, if we had the faith of a mustard seed, that we will be able to tell this mountain to move and it will obey. Go from here to there. So why was John the Baptist so hard on the Pharisees and the Sadducees? In our text today, John understood their ways. This was not new to him. He had been watching what they had been doing for, for probably for a long time. And there was no hesitation when he saw them. He said, you are a brood of vipers, strong, harsh words for this group of people. But that does not have to be the case. That does not have to be the experience of the believer. We are called to a blessed, glorious way to keep up with Christ every single day. And that's just, again, let me pause there. This is a daily practice, a daily practice. We, ex we get so excited for the holidays, don't we? For the different parties and the different, uh, whether it's directly related to waiting for Christ or the celebrations that we have. And yet, God is just as powerful and just as loving to us every single day as he is to any other holiday or any other day. That is what we find here in the scriptures. Christ is for us today, yesterday, today, and forevermore. Let us keep in the spirit. Let us keep in walking with Christ. As he's called us to a beloved relationship. And let us be joyful every day of the season. Amen. No matter how stressful it, it may get. No matter how we may be distracted. It happens to the best of us. Amen. God calls us to be blessed in his presence. What a glorious gift. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. It's a wonderful to be with and worship with you today. God bless you.
What a wonderful day of worship, and it's wonderful to experience the Spirit of God in this place. Won't you pray with me as we prepare to depart, never from God's presence. Pray with me today. May the Lord Jesus Christ, who is the splendor of eternal light, remove from your hearts the darkness of night. Amen. May he drive far from you the snares of the crafty enemy, and always give you his angel of light to guard you. Amen. That you may arise in your morning praises, kept safe in him, in whom is all the, the fullness of your salvation. Amen. Amen. Praise be to God. Go in peace and enjoy God's splendor.